Well, thank you so much Bob, for joining us here at RVA 757 Connects' virtual innovation spotlight for August. My name is Greg Gilligan. I'm the communications director here at RVA 757 Connects. Uh, we have a very interesting program today about an exciting innovation that's taking place right here in the I-64 Innovation Corridor. Um, so we're very excited about this. Let me just go over quickly. We're going to uh, have a word from our sponsor in a moment. I'll update you on some RV757 Connects um, initiatives. Then we'll turn our time, oh, most of our time over to our, our topic today. We'll leave some room for some Q and A's and then we'll talk about what's coming up next. So just wanna let you know that we are recording this session and we will post this on our uh, RVA 757 Connects uh, website here later this month. And also if you have any questions that you wanna to ask to the speakers, use the chat function in the uh, Zoom um, and we will be able to uh, get those questions towards the end. So RVA 757 Connects, you know, is a nonprofit organization. So we rely on our donations and our corporate, one of our corporate sponsors is Atlantic Union Bank, which is based here in Richmond. And it's the largest regional banking company based in the state of Virginia. We got to thank um, uh, Atlantic Union Bank today for sponsoring today's virtual innovation spotlight. And with us is Keith Holzer, who's Atlantic Union Bank's head of business banking. Um, uh, Keith has been, um, has more than 35 years of experience in the uh, banking world um, as a client relationship uh, manager, team leader, and a regional executive. He joined Atlantic Union back in early 2021. He has an undergraduate degree in business administration from West Virginia University and an MBA uh, with a concentration in finance from Virginia Tech. So Keith, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can say a few words and we appreciate you uh, and Atlantic Union Bank for sponsoring us today. Greg, thank you very much for that warm introduction and uh, thank you for allowing me to be here as well. Um, and it's always nice to see some connectivity and roots to WVU, Greg, so thank you. Um, Again, as Greg mentioned, my name is Keith Holzer. I run our business banking group at Atlantic Union Bank and have been here since February of 21. I'm very excited to be here. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Atlantic Union Bank is headquartered in, in Richmond, Virginia. We're a $20 billion regional bank, um, and we have approximately 109 branches and over 135 ATMs throughout Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. We are a traditional bank offering full complement of retail consumer banking services, business offerings, including commercial and corporate banking, leasing, equipment, finance, wealth, private banking, uh, as you would expect. But the interesting thing about Atlantic Union Bank, and this is very exciting, is we are a transformation story. From originally Virginia Community Bank to Virginia's bank, we're very excited to, to be here today. Um, Virginia's first and only statewide independent bank over the last 20 years, and we are an attractive alternative to our large and regional competitors. I like to say, and we like to say, uh, our business model and our culture is to out-local the nationals and out-national the locals. Why is that important? We want to make sure that we are delivering personalized service to our customers and clientele. We want to make sure that we are active in our communities. We want to make sure that we are taking care of our communities and our customers. At the end of the day, customers do business with people they know, like, trust, and can um, develop relationships with. So very excited to be here. Additionally, Atlantic Union Bank executive leadership team has significant experience and also many routes to the Mid-Atlantic region. And I'm excited about to be working with that team today. As I said, uh, from an asset size, we're approximately 20 billion in assets, making us a regional bank, approximately 13 billion in loans, 16 billion in deposits, and a market capitalization of about $3, million, $3 billion, excuse me. We have a statewide footprint, as I mentioned, in Mid-Atlantic. We're the number one regional bank from a deposit market share in Virginia, very strong balance sheet, and are well positioned to continue our organic growth supporting Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic, as well as um, consolidating other smaller regional and community banks throughout the marketplace. We feel like we have the right business leaders and teams in place. We have a reputation that resonates within the Mid-Atlantic, as is evidenced by our market share on the deposit side. We have a wide, widest ever selection of products and services focused on technology and efficiency for our client base. We do have a next generation technology that we are implementing and we have a culture of excellence. 
And again, doing business with customers that we know that they know that they can trust our banking and our relationship is important. And we also have the services to back it up. Um, Forbes ranked Atlantic Union Bank as one of the top banks in 2022 um, across the country. Um, Greenwich also recognized our business banking team in 2021 as Excellence in Business Banking Award. JD Power recognized us as the top consumer satisfaction bank within the Mid-Atlantic region. And Richmond Times Dispatch, uh, also one of the best banks in the Mid-Atlantic. And then just to summarize and finalize, we have uh, John Asbury, our CEO, who also has roots to the Mid-Atlantic, and Maria Tedesco, our president and chief operating officer, two wonderful people who are leading Atlantic Union Bank. We're excited to be here today. Greg, I thank you very much and look forward to the presentation. Great, thanks, Keith. And just as a reminder, too, that uh, Maria is on our board, so that's a, uh, that's a great tie that we have uh, with, with uh, the company. So that, I appreciate that. All right, so let me get back to, so let me just uh, give you some updates as to what's happening with RBA 757 Connects briefly. Um, so we can, you know, one of, one of our, our, our mantras is we like to talk about, we have the power of gaining, connecting and collaborating. Um, because uh, the mega region, to the mega region from Richmond all the way down to Hampton Roads to ensure that the future economic growth and prosperity for everyone uh, in the I-64 Innovation Quarter. As you can see, we're pursuing several priorities and we have some exciting news to, and updates to, to provide you with that. First off, we have good news to report that one of our top priorities, uh, the, the General Assembly has taken a giant step towards funding the I-64 gap. Our focus was advocating funds to widen the 29 mile stretch between interstate on um, interstate 64 between Bottoms Bridge and the life of exits. And it's just been always notorious for backups, uh, traffic backups. The project had an expected total cost of about $750 million. But unfortunately, there was no funding in the state budget for that project until now. Through the team, through team effort, the General Assembly approved the state budget uh, last in June, I should say, that calls for $470 million in state funds. And Governor Youngkin signed that budget. So they worked together on, on funding this. Then the Central Virginia Transportation Authority also approved a commitment of $100 million. And VDOT has applied for a $150 million grant. So in all toll, if we get the money, if, if they get the money from the federal grant and that comes through, um, this project will be nearly fully funded. It's important to note that RV 757 Connect's collective uh, efforts made an impact on this particular project. Another one of our priorities is to make the Richmond and the Hampton Roads mega region the next global internet hub, but we need a strategic plan out to make this happen. Um, the I-64 Innovation Quarter has many assets in place needed to become a global internet hub. Coming ashore in Virginia Beach are three subsea cables connecting the United States to Spain, France, Puerto Rico, and Brazil. These cables are three of the most modern, high capacity routes in the entire world. A fourth cable is under development and will be the first and only cable to connect the United States with South uh, Africa. These deep sea cables connect to, into Henrico County where Facebook has invested $2 billion, I should say, in a 2 million square foot data center operation. And that right next door to that uh, data center, Henrico, also in Henrico, uh, is the QTS Richmond Network Access Point, which is the world's fourth largest integration center. And QTS is now underway and expanding that facility to double its size. The initiative was one of the findings from the I-64 Innovation Quarter Opportunity Study that was conducted last year that was funded in part by a Go Virginia grant. Thanks again to Go Virginia for, for doing that. Full report is available on the RVA 757 Connects website, so please check it out. It has a lot of great information there. The planning process for the Global Internet Hub has started. Our first steering committee met last week with about 50 people attending. It was the first of six meetings that we'll have this year to help provide, uh, and the, the committee will help provide a perspective to review documents and research findings and help us formulate the strategy. The strategic planning initiative received a $100,000 grant uh, from Go Virginia, regions four and five. 
And um, we also re it also received uh, funding, additional planning funding for Dominion Energy, Henrico County, uh, Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads Alliance, Old Dominion University, and Dragonfly Group. The committee members are come from a variety of different uh, places. There are companies like Bank of America and CarMax. There's digital infrastructure uh, firms like Meta, Meta, which is Facebook's parent company, and QTS and the subsea cable owners. There are broadband firms on the committee. There's cyber companies on the committee, as well as those representing utilities, planning agencies, chambers, economic development entities, and the military. We're in the process of creating a project website to help the committee members, plus to serve as a resource repository for all of the research findings that we have. Another one of our focus areas is to support and promote innovation taking place here in the mega region. And that brings us to today's topic on the new hydroponic uh, greenhouse operation in Goochland County. Greenswell Growers is producing fresh leafy greens at a large scale indoor growing facility that opened last year. The climate controlled and highly automated hydroponic farming operation can produce, and this is fascinating, they can produce 750,000 pounds of leafy greens on its 1.5 acre plot there under uh, you know, the greenhouse per year. And you compare that with 33,000 pounds per 1.5 acres a year and in a you know, conventional growing operation. That's just mind boggling when you think about it. And, and Carl and Chuck, will, our, our speakers will talk a little bit more about that. Greenswell Growers supplies its fresh greens to grocery stores, restaurants in Virginia, um, and they'll tell us more about where you can get some of these products. So our speakers today are is Chuck Metzger. He's the former managing director for human resource consulting firm, uh, Mercer Group. He's the chairman and co-founder of Greenswell Growers. Chuck worked with and founded the business with Doug Pick, who is the president and CEO of Feedmore. That's the hunger relief agency that operates Virginia's largest food bank based here in the Richmond area. And John May, a retired technology industry professional who is the president and CEO of the Center for Innovation and Development in Kilmarnock. Carl Gupta is running the operation as president of Greenswell Growers. He worked in management positions focusing on the food industry for packaging companies such as Polig Packaging, 3C Packaging, and Commonwealth Packaging Corporation. Let me just tell you, if you have any questions at, at, during the presentation, again, remember, use the chat function so that we can, um, you, they'll go to me and I'll be able to ask the questions to our two speakers. Let me just tell you, we, I went out to Greensville Growers about two weeks ago, went out there with uh, two of my colleagues here, uh, Colin Martin and Mia Fuller, and both of us, were they were out there uh, videoing this for, we're going to show you a video in just a second. But um, we, uh, we, full disclosure, they gave us containers of this particular product, of their product out there. And we all came back after eating it. And we were just blown away by the, the freshness, the taste. It has better taste than you could get um, in a traditional grocery store uh, bag, a lot lettuce and stuff. So let me, uh, we're going to show you a video. If you just give me one second here. There we go. Audio not working.
Okay, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, there was uh, audio with that uh, video, uh, and hopefully we'll get that uh, figured out and we will show it uh, towards the end. But let me turn it over, the program over, to, uh, uh, to Chuck and to Carl to talk about uh, Greenswell Growers. Stop sharing the stop sharing. There we go. Y'all see everything? Um, my name is Carl Gupton. I'm the president of Greenswell Growers, and I'm here with Chuck Metzger, our chairman of the board and co-founder. So thank you everybody for coming, and. Um, <clears throat> We hope you have an opportunity to uh, share what we're doing at some time down the road. So let me start as simply as possible, and I'll get into the founders and a few other things on how we got started uh, very shortly. But our mission statement and our mission is as simple as we can make it. And it's exactly what you see there on the screen. It is plants first. And the reason for that is as we sell retail, to consumers and we sell through institutional food service, uh, wholesale distributors to restaurants, senior living, healthcare and colleges and universities. At the end of the day, this is all about uh, what the consumer is tasting and looking at in front of them. And that is our ultimate and our main driver. And we have done everything we can to make that the best product available. So we'll come back to that in just a second, but Carl, if you could move forward. So let me explain uh, who you're looking at here. These are the three founders, Doug Pick on the right, the chairman of Feedmore, uh, John May on the left there, who is uh, a retiree from Northern Virginia. And let me explain to all of you how we actually got started on this. Um, Doug Pick and I have known each other for a, a very long time. And literally eight years ago, he came to me and he said, we are uh, down about 12 million pounds of leafy greens. Let's figure out a way to find them in the state of Virginia from field growers. So he and I got in cars and drove around and we we're looking for commercial scale field growers of that product who were willing to donate their twos and their threes that they couldn't sell in farmer's markets and very small mom and pop grocery stores. And at the end of the day, uh, we came up with this many growers in the state of Virginia that could do that. And we looked at each other after so many months and said, what's just happened here? And uh, at the same time, we found a couple of um, greenhouses in the state. One was the very large one in Radford, 18 acres that was put up back then growing only tomatoes, doing extremely well, a Canadian and a Mexican company. And we found kind of a small scale greenhouse and one thing led to another and, and uh, we said, I wonder if we could do this. So we started to research. Well, in the middle of our researching, we met this gentleman by the name of John May, who was a high tech individual in Northern Virginia for most of his corporate career and then he started a, a startup company in the internet space. Um, and he had retired to the Northern Neck. We found him and I was giving a presentation down there. And at the end of the presentation, John came up to me and he said, uh, tell me what you're doing. We told him, he said, um, you know, I think we could really make this work. I'd love to work with you. So at the end of the day, uh, these this older set became the founders of Greenswell Growers. And we wanna show you a little bit of what we did when we got started. So if you look in the upper left, you'll see what we did, which the key thing we did was we wanted to know what the public was looking for. And the public consumers were looking for eat local. They were looking for uh, things that were not transported to them a long distance and they were looking for how products were sustainably grown. And in doing that research, we came up with a statistic that frankly, very few consumers truly understand, which is that 95% of our leafy greens in the United States of America are grown in California and Arizona. And as we really figured that out, 
uh, in reality, it became very clear that this was uh, an increasing problem. And as everybody knows, because you read the papers and watch the television screens like, like we do, there's a drought in California and it's not a minor drought. It's a major drought and it is getting worse. And if you knew how many farmers are there and the amount of leafy greens that are produced in both those states, it's mind boggling. They get in the truck and they come everywhere else in the United States of America. So that's number two. Um, so as we looked at that and we said to ourselves, well, as we were doing our more of our research, we found at that point, there were only about five or six growers that were using greenhouses of some form or another in the USA. And we said, we think we can do this. So we created a business model. And um, the very first thing that we did was we created three purposes. And that first purpose we showed you on the first flat slide, it was plants first. So what did we do about that? We were three um, senior citizens and we said, we're not gonna operate this greenhouse because we don't have any experience. What do we do now? So we searched around the country and we came up with a small to medium size uh, grower and a builder of greenhouses that could see the future. And they, they saw where they wanted to go. They had built in 48 states and also taught uh, people that had bought their small greenhouses how to grow inside of them. They said, we can see the future. We can see that you do also, let's partner, which we did. Um, and the uh, second thing that we did uh, in creating our business model was we created um, the three most important purposes that we have as a company. The first was plants first. The second was uh, sustainably grown and packaged. Carl's gonna tell you all the details about, about that but we don't use any pesticides. And the one summary I will tell you on this individual topic is that the product that we all buy today, it doesn't matter where, has a shelf life coming from California of Arizona in total of roughly five to seven days. The, the way we do our work here, our shelf life is minimally two weeks up to 21 days. And we will explain that to you shortly. Um, so that's number two. And our um, third purpose is community involvement. And we do that in a variety of ways. The first thing we do is we donate 5% of our product to Feed More and Goochland Cares. Feed More is the largest food bank in the state of Virginia. Uh, the second thing we do, and we're sitting in a conference room, and behind us you can see the, uh, through the um, plate glass windows we have, you can see into our actual greenhouse. Um, and we use this conference room for a variety of things, but one of those things is um, we work with a variety of different um, educational enterprises. One of them is Goochland County High School, who has a career and technical education center. And of their 450 high school kids, there's 150 in the program who don't want to go to college. They want to get skilled trade jobs, and we are teaching them how to do that in this particular industry. The second thing is we're working with Virginia Tech on hires and interns, and you may not know it, but there's only two colleges in the United States of America that give kids degrees in control environment agriculture. Virginia Tech is trying to be number three or number four. Uh, we also deal with Reynolds Community College with interns and um, employees. And the final thing we do, and then I'm turning this over to Carl, is uh, when you hear what he has to say, we have a very minor root system that after we've cut the leaves off the plants and we donate that, we donate that to the Watkins nurseries of the world, to farmers and other nurseries. And th that's what we call our community involvement. So that's my short story and here's Carl Gupton. All right. And Marshall, I saw you on the call. So thank you for everything you do. Uh, Marshall Hall with no, they actually pick up our compost and take it away. And we're keeping them busy these days as we continually expand the greenhouse. So <clears throat> to Chuck's point that we, he was talking to, 95% um, of what we consume comes out of Arizona or California. That's a big number. Uh, and that's got to ship all the way across the country. One 
you've got you're coming out of air an area that has limited resources that are there which is showcase kind of here this is a picture um shot from space of the colorado river which feeds a chunk of the arizona farms um, this is 2020 2021 and 2022 what looks wrong with this picture unbelievable how the natural resources are being depleted out west not only do they not have enough for farming, they're really at the point where there's limited for the population that's out there. And you're talking about a very densely populated area. So what really attracted me to this business, you know, when I sat down with Chuck uh, years ago at this point, uh, we kind of talked through it. The business model, what made so much sense was that, you know, everything's coming out of California that's got limited resources, limited labor, and then it's got to ship all the way across the country. Um, and the reason this business model works is, you know, farms are shrinking out there. There's more, there's less and less farmers each year to meet the demands as our population grows and our consumption grows in produce. And the, you know, the, we've got a logistics problem in this country. That's one of the big things. This has got to ship all the way across the country. It's harvested one day, processed, and then three days later, it shows up on the East Coast where Chuck was saying it's five to seven days of shelf life when it hits the East Coast. That's probably on the high end. Um, the reason people kind of are somewhat, it's one of the largest shrink items in the produce department is that it just doesn't have the shelf life. Our product, because we're able to take control of the environment in there, we're able to extend the shelf life of the product through limited freight. We take freight out of there. We take labor out of there and it's at your door the next day. So there's kind of three different ways of farming these days. Ours is greenhouse grown. That is the way that we believe these, the, the world is evolving right now. Conventional farming is what we see today out there. Conventional farming is what's in California and what you're used to consuming. There are other You'll hear Chuck and I refer to CEA. CEA is Controlled Environment Agriculture. That's kind of the acronym for our industry. Um, there's kind of two different types of CEA. There's greenhouse and there's vertical farm. The two of them together kind of work. It's probably the wave of the future because from the greenhouse perspective against conventional farming, we get a 26 X yield of our product out of our system. Now, we have an acre and a half that's under roof right now. Uh, we have plans to go to four and a half acres out of this facility by expanding. But that one acre and a half that we have here, to Greg's point, you may have heard him say it earlier, is we can harvest about 750,000 pounds annually out of our system. That acre and a half in Salinas, California would yield somewhere between 33,000 and 35,000 pounds annually. So we're able to do a heck of a lot more with a lot less. Um, so then we bring the logistics closer to the population. 70% of the population lives east of the Mississippi. Um, 70%, actually, no, sorry, 70% of the population lives on the Atlantic seaboard. Um, so we're able to serve that population, take that truck. That truck out of California pre-pandemic would have cost about $4,500 to come across our country. Right now, that same truck is in excess of $14,000 to come across the country. And at this point, you don't even know if you're gonna get it if you're willing to pay for it because of the trucking system. The average age in the trucking system is something like 57, 58 years old. So you've got an aging population that's going on with the trucking. So there's a limited amount of truckers, there's limited availability. Also, the neat thing about our operation is we're able to, to harvest this acre and a half with about 12 people inside of our facility. So we really limit our overhead and the labor demands. We do that through automation. That automation allows us to go from seed to your fridge with no human hands touching the product when it comes to our retail packaging. A retail packaging also has extended shelf life with it that allows us to remove the oxygen out of the package and allows us to use less plastics. Um, one of the big things of that increased shelf life is one, our packaging, and two is the environment that we keep in this greenhouse. The nice thing about the greenhouse is we're able to keep the temperature 
from night to day is about a seven degree to eight degree change. And we're able to control that environment down to the nth degree. We have 13 sensors inside of the greenhouse that constantly check temperature, humidity, light levels, how much light has the plant gotten today, and then airflow. So we're, try, we're constantly moving air through the facility, helping that plant grow, putting it in the perfect situ situation to grow. Um, and then we take the food concerns. You know, everybody's heard about the E. coli recalls of romaine in the fields. Well, that comes from people touching the product or the soil being tainted by matter, matters um, from the retention pond that may have some bacteria levels in it that may have come from humans or animals. Um, so we're able to control that water that goes into our system. We're able to feed it perfectly every single day, 365 days a year. You can actually see behind Chuck and I is the greenhouse. The greenhouse, if you see the shades are actually closed right now. We're in what we're calling our afternoon siesta for our product. We, we give it a break at the high temperature levels of the day from about noon, from about 1130 to about three o'clock, we'll shut those shades because the plant one has already gotten enough light for the day. It's gotten all the light it's gonna process by this point in time, the sensors tell us so. And then on top of it, we're able to cool the greenhouse down to a, to a very controlled environment that we have in there and get to the numbers that we want to. So that's against conventional farming. Vertical farming is another thing that you will hear out there. And you know, greenhouse and vertical farming are the way of the future. Greenhouse is a little bit more established and we're using against kind of vertical farming. Vertical farming is typically done indoors and maximizes the cube that's inside of maybe a warehouse somewhere in New Jersey or places like that. They're typically in urban setups. They use a lot more power than we do because <clears throat> we're harvesting what mother nature gives us. And what, that, what I mean by that is we're using as much sunlight that we can. We're just making the, the conventional farming process go a little smoother. We're giving what mother nature gives us and making it just a little bit better. Our system uses peat moss in the system that allows us to be, use a hybrid system um, that gives us a soil base that goes with it along with those seeds. We grow in these 18 foot long channels. So we're able to move these through the system through a closed loop system. Vertical farming grows in trays and they have to do a lot of manpower moving back and forth. Um, <clears throat> something that we've noticed from our end um, is that our product, because we're using so much of what mother nature, it tastes better. And it'd be a plain and simple, that plants first theory that Chuck talked about is something we believe in. And the product just tastes different. We brought in major retailers um, through some help of maybe people on this call um, that tasted our product and couldn't believe they came in and said, oh yeah, it's CEA, it's gonna look pretty, but it's really not gonna have any taste. We saw heads turn when they, when they tasted our product. And it's really because we're using mother nature, we're using the right things in there and we create a product that just tastes great. Um, we have people do it. And the nice thing is we're able to do that through consistency and consistency comes from automation. That automation that we have in the system measures everything and moves everything in the system. It's a closed loop growing system where we're able to handle the entire greenhouse in about with about 10 to 12 people inside of there with all the movements. We'll harvest today about 2000 pounds through six people's hard work in the packaging room, which is kind of a crazy thought to it. And it's, you know, this vertical farms, they're, um, their balance sheets and PL look a lot different than ours. Um, it's a very capital intensive uh, process. While we're capital intensive, they've got a lot, they're usually buying expensive land outside of major cities. And then there's a lot of computer systems that go into managing it and the power that drives behind it. So here's the quick shot into our greenhouse. That acre and a half is that 56, 57,000 square feet. We're able to maximize the, the square footage that we have out there. Just about every inch in the greenhouse, and Greg can probably validate this, is used for growing system. Um, there's very narrow hallways as a six foot five guy that I am. I don't fit through them quite the way that I would hope because we're growing as much space out there as needed. 
And as you can see, these white channels that the product's growing in, they're actually moving behind us right now in the dark. Um, they're 18 feet long. They're two inch by two inch U-shaped channels where we put a medium in it, which is that peat, and we drop 120 seeds into just about each channel. In those channels, we get, it's very uniform because it's an automated seeder that we use that drops them in the specific spot that we want it to go into. And we're able to grow those channels. It gives them just enough space to go up, then out is the way that we want it to grow. And on top of that, we've got room for expansion. So we've got, a, we've got a, this acre and a half that's under roof now. We can repeat this two more times to the east. So we'll have about three times the growing space that will go in there. And to Greg's point, I mean, we're talking, you're talking over two and a half million pounds, two and a half million pounds we'll be able to grow with all three places built out. It's a full, and then those, once it goes in the greenhouse, it goes through a little hole in the wall. <laughs> it swings 90 degrees in these 18 foot long channels. It goes into the packaging room. The packaging room is fully automated. So basically two circular blades decap the lettuce right above the, the rim of the channel. And that allows us to harvest all the products that we can. And our product's different. Um, I'm, I'm obviously biased as it's our product, um, but it tastes different. Uh, the green leaf that we grow has got what's called a midrib down there where you get that crunch and that, that wetness of the product um, that goes along with the leaf that's got the sweetness and a little bit of bitterness to it. So basically you get a crunch and you get flavor. Very few lettuces have this kind of taste to it. That's what kind of blows away a lot of our, our competition on the shelf is our product just tastes different. And then on top of that, it tastes great and it lasts, for, it lasts forever. Um, that packaging system that we use is a, full, is a fully nitrogen flush system that replaces the oxygen that would be in the package that would turn into water and converts it, um, kind of flushes it out of the package and allows it to be shelf stable for longer periods of time. With that, also that top seal where we're flushing it allows us to use 30 tons less plastic annually than the traditional clamshell base and clamshell lid that you see out there. So we're able to reduce our pet. One roll of that film is about equivalent to a pallet's worth of lids. So we're able to use a lot less plastic. And that's something we've really got to do out here in the world today. So right now we have two products that we're offering. Um, Essential Greenleaf. Essential Greenleaf is our kind of mainstay product. It's got a crunchy, light feel to it with a lot of flavor that packs into it. It's, it's a fantastic replacement. I hate saying the words iceberg lettuce, but it's got, it's got the function, the crunch that you see with iceberg, but you actually get flavor with it. Our second product is our Vibrant Greens Blend. This is kind of a modern take on the traditional old school spring mix. You get a green leaf, a red leaf, and an arugula. You get three different flavors and textures that come with it. You get the big crunchiness of the, of the green leaf. You get kind of a soft feel of the red leaf, a little more tender. And then you get the pop, the pepper, the little buttery taste of a micro arugula. All three kind of work together in harmony to create a salad that you just haven't tasted before. And our next blend will be coming out later in August and that will be our refreshing romaine blend. That will be a mixture of baby romaine and our green leaf. Um, the baby romaine is actually a lot more tender than what you're used to when you hear the words romaine. Um, so we mixed it with our green leaf and most everything we do will be tied to our green leaf because that's our, that's our mothership product. Um, so overall, kind of where can you find us? Major retailers today in the greater Richmond area, uh, we have Food Lion. We have a 70 store set up right now in Metro RVA. And then in the Hampton Roads area and Nova area, you have Harris Teeter. Um, Harris Teeters took off with us in Northern Virginia, went out to the 757 area and really took off with it. Um, typically with a lot of retailers, you see what's called a pipe fill. You see the pipe fill and then kind of stabilize. Uh, with Harris Teeter and with Food Line, we're experiencing now that we've seen incremental sales growth each week with them. Um, we really haven't flattened out too much with either one of them. 
Um, I have to give a shout out to our local retailers here in Richmond uh, with Libby Market being the first one to carry our product along with Elwood Thompson and Good Foods Grocer. They kind of proved our business model with us that people wanted it and we've still got growing, um, growing with them every week. Restaurant wise in RVA, you can find us at Demi's and Dots Back In. Buckheads um, in town, Sam Miller's, Baker's Crust, uh, Taza Restaurant Group, Boathouse, and our local favorite around the corner, uh, not on the list, is Lola's Farmhouse Bistro. Uh, they were one of the first adopters for us. In the Hampton Roads area, you've got Bay Local, uh, Kumar, Ocean House, uh, York River Oyster Company, and Baker's Crust as well. So you can kind of get us, our target market is kind of the higher end restaurants that you're seeing here. Um, but we're also, you know, the restaurant tours found were one of our early takeoffs on this. They did a great job with it because they loved our product because of the shelf life and there's limited cooler space that they have in each restaurant. And then on top of that, they, our product was filling out their plates. So our product maybe had been a little bit of a premium but they made it back tenfold and not throwing away the product uh, because they were scrapping about 30% of the product out of that. And then on top of that, they were using a lot less product on the shelf, on their plates where they were using three ounces with traditional, they were using two ounces. So you can also actually going back to that, you will also find us in one major retailer as well, kicking off this week in our salad programs. Um, our good friends at Ucrops Homestyle Foods have a product launching this week uh, with our Vibrant Greens blend in Kroger. Um, so hopefully we, you guys get out there when you're looking for that prepared sa salad meal that you go out there and grab our salad and get a good taste of it through our friends at Ucrops Homestyle Foods. So overall, uh, the background, you know, Chuck walks you through the business model. We're a well-funded business model, kind of thought out along the way. You know, it's local, it's sustainable, it's consistent product year round um, through the environment that we operate. And we bring something different to the table in the predictable supply. Um, we're able to, with that irregularities of the West Coast supply, we're able to 365 supply our our customers with what they want at a very consistent product. And we're a true, and what we believe in is we're a true partner with our community. Um, Chuck made mention to that. This whole idea is a derivative based off Feedmore's need to want to help feed the community. And we, we truly believe in what we do with that. So Greg, I'll hand it back over to you and we can go to any questions that you would want. Wow, that was fascinating, Carl. I really appreciate it, and Chuck, too. Uh, well, let me just start off with one question that I have. So I mean, you may have, if you said that, I apologize, but how long does it take from seed to packaging for the leaves to grow? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so from seed to harvest is about 21 to 28 days, depending on the product. In a traditional farm setting, what, about three or four months, Chuck, would you say? At least, at least they get three to four harvest a year, depending on conditions in the in the farm setting. Wow, that's that's great. So if you notice, uh, the, oh, let me tell you, there's, there was a chat in the chat. So one person wanted to know, what do we need in order to expand your market share in Virginia? That was a question from sales, sales, sales. <laughs> Go out and demand it from our from your local retailers. Um, you know. I have to give Food Lion a lot of credit and Harris Teeter as well. Harris Teeter was a great partner to start off with. Um, we're growing like crazy with them. They believe in the local programs. The grocery stores that you know we wanna do business with are people that believe in the local farmers, um, whether that's conventional or greenhouse or even vertical farms. I just believe that this is the space we go. The local food system has to be right. We have to support it. Um, Chuck, go. There are two or three more, Greg, uh, on the table that are coming across pretty quickly just to answer the question that way. Well, let me just say, and, and if Bobby, you want to talk, what well, we will un unmute you. But yeah. uh, Bobby, you crop just to uh, put on the chat that beginning on Wednesday, August the 3rd, that's tomorrow, Ucrop's new balsamic and blue salad will feature Greenswell growers lettuce and will be available in 65 Kroger stores and at the Ucrop's market hall. Bobby, do you, you want to unmute Bobby? 
Um, we're going to unmute you, Bobby. Do you want to? Do you want to talk about why did you all decide to use them? Well, it's a great product, but we love to eat it, and um, so we think our customers will like it, and they already have been. We've actually had it in the market hall um, for some time, and I'm I'm actually in the room here with uh, Scott Aronson and Chris Cantner, who uh, together with me are really very excited about this product, and so. The good news is this particular salad um, not only has the uh, product from Greenswell Growers, but it also just to, talks about we have crumbled blue cheese in it, sweetened dried cranberries, walnuts, red cabbage, green onions, and then the balsamic vinaigrette. It is really yummy. And we've had some of the people that um, we love to be able to sell them this product uh, actually taste it, and they've been very excited about it. So that the the, the facility out there on Hockett Road is very impressive. The fact that it is so sanitary, the fact that this product in the summertime, every 21 days you have a harvest and literally that product can be harvested and in the store the next day. Great. Thank, that, thanks, uh, Bob. We appreciate it. Great. Can I just say something? Sure, Jim. Yeah, Jim, Jim Ucrop also. Okay. Just very quickly, something I've been waiting for someone to say all along is not a human hand touches a seed from the time it starts until the time it's in a package. This is this is Ronnie. Can I can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. How how does the consumer know that it is locally produced and it has all the benefits that you have mentioned? Because when you go to the supermarket now, I mean you're inundated. Uh, you know, with different different salads. So how how does the consumer know? And even though you talk about um, you know transportation costs not being there since it's local, doesn't the greenhouse power and all that add? So how does it compare price wise? Ah, compare price first off, it's we're competitive. Maybe we're the higher end of the market, but we're very competitive with traditional with traditional farming because we use so much less labor and we take the logistics out of the system um, for it. Uh, get back to you, how, how can you tell? Uh, Chuck made a great point. We grabbed one right at the top. It says grown with love in Goochland County, Virginia. And then you get a nice Virginia flag over there. Kind of wanted to make that prominent because we, we want people to know that this product is grown right here in, in the great state of Virginia. All right, thank you. <clears throat> yep. Great, great question. Um, Michelle? Too far, I do want to give a quick shout out to both Bobby and Jim for that. They have been great partners with us as we get up and running, um, Scott and Chris as well. They've been, they believe in the cause that we've got here and have helped us kind of work through a lot of the um, the the hoops to jump through with retailers. They It's great to have guys behind us that have, have this industry kind of nailed down. So. Hey, Carl, if I could yes, just sir. add that one of the things back to the previous question, there's a sticker, at least on the products that, that we're currently selling, yep. that actually have the green swell growers, a little um, sticker here. In fact, we actually have put this product in our pinwheels right now. Yep. Oh, and on the little pinwheel package, it does show the, um, so it has the logo on there. Yeah, no, we slap our logo on everything we can these days. <laughs> Michelle, you had a question? Yeah, I just, um, I, I know we're bringing a group of uh, restaurateurs uh, on, on Thursday to, to tour the plant, but it is so noticeable. It's like when you pick a, a tomato off a vine, uh, in your backyard and eat eat the that's the the, the the how you relate to tasting the the lettuce but i do think um uh, like me and and other people it's really just letting people know about this product that it is you know with the shelf life uh and the taste it's just really great to spread the word to uh, other restaurateurs and grocery stores and let me just point let me just to, to, to follow up on that michelle you know, Todd Haymore just put in the chat about how to both Bobby and Jim's point is that the best way to promote this product is to get the locally owned retailers and restaurateurs to carry it. Ask them why they're not, you know, selling the product. Um, 
And when he was, you know, Secretary of Agriculture and, and, and Commissioner of the Ag Department, they, they did it. You know, he makes the point that it's hard to break into the nationals, yep. national change. You did it with Harris Teeter, which is owned by Kroger, and you did it with Food Lion, which is, you know, a multinational uh, international company. And for the restaurant, for the restaurant side to it, one of the bigger ones to embrace this early was our partner with uh, Performance Food Groups. They really believed in the product, and they were probably one of the early adopters um, in pushing it. Um, you know, you never thought at a food show or sure. restaurant tours that we would have a line around our booth trying to try our lettuce. So. Uh, Carl and, and, and uh, Chuck, let me ask you, uh, you know, people always ask in, in grocery stores, so is this product organic or not? Um, it is not organic by the USDA standards. Um, the reason is because some of our nutrients come from our watering system. To be USDA organic, you have to be from the soil for all of your ingredients that come with it. In Europe, yes, this would be 100% organic. It's just our food system's changing. The USDA is, change, is trying to change with it. It's just taking them a little bit longer with it. You got to think Europe's got a 20 year head start on us when it comes to this. It right. is, in my, in my opinion, it's better than organic because it's controlled. The plant is growing under such less stress that will be out there and creates for a better tasting product. The, uh, the answer that I would throw out, Greg, would be all of us as consumers in the last number of years have had basically one product to buy, which was conventional field grown, which made sense because that's what it was. And all of a sudden organic showed up and it was grown in a commercial scale. And now if all of us go to the grocery store, we have two alternatives. And the organic uh, is going like this for obvious reasons. Now what has to happen is the consumer needs to get educated on the third option here. And the retailers are trying to figure out how to do that. And we, we have a big uh, continued uh, growth in our social media and our website to do that exact education. Yep. Uh, Todd, hey more, uh, good to see you on here. Thanks for your comment. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, thanks, Greg. I was just gonna ask Carl and the team if they were or had been working with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and the Virginia Finest and Virginia Grown programs. Yeah, VDAX has been a big partner with us um, from startup. They've actually been, they've been heavily involved from the beginning, whether it's the extension office through Virginia Tech, um, and then VDAX, as we get out to the marketing side to it, they have been really kind of helping us along the way, pushing retailers, chasing, chasing people's um, kind of views of, of our product and making awareness. Uh, we did a Virginia Finest food show, right. uh, their first one uh, back in July. Yep. And or June, sorry, June. And it was great turnout with it. Every single major grocery retailer was there with it. And VDAX was the big leader behind that. Great. I, as the old commissioner and secretary, that's just music to my ears. So yeah. I'm glad to know you're, those are your taxpayer dollars um, uh, there to be uh, utilized. So I'm glad you're taking advantage of it. Keep it up. And uh, if they, VDAX ever gives you any problems, let me know. I still have a few friends there. <laughs> <laughs> they do not give us Bill Scruggs and his group are just solid to work with. So. Carl and, and Chuck, let me ask you, there is a question from Brian uh, Freshcorn who wanted to know the prevalence of PFAS, which I'm not sure what this stands for. I'm sure someone will explain it. It's a hot item right now. Any idea how your PFAS levels in production and packaging compared to your competitors? So what is PFAS? Got me on that one. Oh, no. Acronyms sometimes creep up uh, out there. Uh, uh, Brian, do you, uh, we're going to unmute you, Brian. Do you know, can you explain to us maybe? You... He's still there, Brian. Synthetic, synthetic chemicals. Um, sorry, I used the quick Google machine on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's talking about synthetic chemicals that are out there. That's something we try not to use in, a, in our process. Um, pesticide, we're pesticide free uh, for all intensive purposes. 
we're more chemical pesticide free. We do use some bugs to help control control our bugs inside of the greenhouse. We use what's called nematodes in the system to to offset trying or not using chemical pesticides. Um, so that that level of classification when it comes to pesticides, a bug, a wasp that a wasp that we release into the greenhouse could technically be classified as a pesticide. So we're trying to use biologicals instead of chemical pesticides. If that makes sense. And Carl, you and I briefly talked about this too, but can you tell us in terms of the use of water? At, you're, you're, you're using some municipal water, but your hope is that eventually you'll yeah. use uh, that. Yeah, so from, from our, we tried, Chuck, uh, we tried to drill a well out here and we got how many gallons of water? Zero. <laughs> So <laughs> that was our that was our first goal. So then we went to the municipal route and tied into the kind of the Heroico Goochland line out of 288. Uh, for the first year, we are using municipal water. We use a very little. I'm not going to say little water. We use a lot less than traditional farming would for that. So your municipal water uh, kind of works pretty well for us. I will say we are trying to transition to our um, pond system that we are our pond, um, the retention pond. Our only worry is we want to make sure that when we bring that water back into the facility that it's treated properly. Um, there has been some concerns. I mean, I'm FISMA certified um, and HCAP plus certified myself personally and the facility. Um, I'm somehow the, the auditor of it. Or, um, but what we can find is the biggest worry of both of those two is your water source. Your water source can be what contaminates your product. Um, so we have to figure out, I wanna make sure nothing's in that pond. We spend a year testing it to understand what's there. We also take all of our rainwater and feed it out to that pond so we can bring it back in eventually. Um, I will say we learned a lot about municipal water as well um through using it <laughs> we you know we do have to take some little different treatment with it we feed it through our RO system um, to make sure that it's got the right chlorine levels inside of it wow. no. well carl i, I appreciate it it's, it's the, the witching hour of one o'clock and I, I really appreciate you and, and uh giving us you know this opportunity to, to talk about greenswell growers and, and the innovations that's taking place out there thank you so very much let me just real quick, because I do want to make sure that we, we wrap up here um, at the right time. Um, and just to let you know what's happening next, the, we will have a recorded link to this session on our website here in the next uh, uh, week or so. And what we will do is, and unfortunately, the uh, you know technology is great, and we're using technology, but unfortunately, it, it didn't work today with, with the video. We do want to share that video with you, so we will email you a link to that video so you can watch that video because it is fascinating to see what they're doing out there. And Carl talks about it also on the video too. Uh, coming up in October, October 13th, 14th, we're gonna have our two day internet inter-regional bus tour of the Richmond region and the Hampton Roads region for Convergence 2022. So stay tuned, we'll give you more details on that. Uh, our next innovation spotlight will be on September the 6th from noon, Tuesday, September 6th. And we will announce that uh, the topic here in the next week or so. Um, again, here are some ways you can uh, help advance the RVA 757 Connects um, in terms of following us, suggest future topics, uh, invite us to your organization uh, so we can talk about it. Again, thank you uh, for joining us there. Thank you also to our sponsor, Atlantic Union Bank. Uh, we appreciate your support of that. And we will see you uh, at our next uh, Innovation Spotlight on September the 6th. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you again, Carl, and to Chuck. Thanks, Greg.